What I say to that is, yeah, there's rare cases, but what I say to that, if you got a, if you got a, a couple that one of them smokes crack and the other one is clean, have never done drugs in their life, you've seen that over time, years later, four or five years later, they both start smoking crack. So, you know, when I was telling you about a month ago that I ran out my house and I was actually thrown out my house. So I was going, I was staying at Khaled's house. Thank you, Khaled Khaled's. Uh, I was staying at uh, Rich Player's house, Rich the Barber's house. I was just floating all over homeless, eat me and my sugar-free ice pops. And, uh, and it's because my daughter came back and we heard a rumor that one of her friends that she was with had tested positive for COVID. And so the minute they walk in my house and they tell me that, I run, I grab a bag of clothes, throw my mask on, and I left. I don't believe, uh, you know, this ain't the captain of the ship that the captain has to stay on the ship and get sick to and flow overboard. I think if wifey have it, you got to leave. And quarantine, let her quarantine, support her, bring her the food, do everything you can with your mask on. But protect everybody. You know, when you're on a plane, they give you the, they, they say, put the mask on yourself first. The oxygen mask on yourself first. And so, I don't think you not not keeping it real. Um, Depends. Uh, me, you already know the routine. My house, Khaled lives five minutes away from me. Uh, my mother's house. And so yesterday we had a big scare because th today, I don't want to tell you, but one of my friends owns a restaurant. The whole restaurant, the whole staff got Corona. They got to shut down for two weeks. This is one of my good, good friends. And so every day I keep hearing shit like that. Pretty Lou, I see you. You said no life, no nothing. You're right, Pretty Lou. Man been fighting cancer for five years. The real one, the leukemia. Uh, we with you, Pretty Lou, and we love you. Um, but every day. And, uh, and so we talk about it. I do all I can to encourage you to be safe. I try my best to be safe. Could I be even stricter? Yes, I could, could not come out my. I, I went at least three three months of my house, of my life in that crib and never came out. Not even Cali, not nobody. I just stayed in my crib and wouldn't even come outside. Yeah, you could do that. I don't like it. Nobody thinks it's dope. But if that's gonna keep us alive. Then that's what we got to do. Pretty Lou, you already know I love you. You're my inspiration. Uh, nobody's as strong as you. You're not even fighting for yourself. You're fighting for thousands of people who follow you um, and believe that you'll pull through from cancer. And you're here, unfortunately, in your life, fighting a tough battle that you didn't ask for, but it's really to inspire people. And... Every now and then, if you look up Job in the Bible, and I'm not going to act like I'm the biggest preacher. Shout out to Reverend Run. Yesterday, he brought the light. You see my brother DJ Khaled? He's been all about the light. Meaning we not with the dark shit. We out the dark. So whenever you got somebody around you draining you, draining your soul, draining you, just stay away from them, man. Walk towards the light. If you have thoughts of depression or whatever, walk towards the light. You have to walk towards the light rather than stay there. Anybody can sit there and think about all of this, 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 and, and drown yourself. You drown yourself in the dark, and the next thing you know, you're depressed, you this, you that. Walk towards the light. I told you I went through depression for two years straight. Not the fake depression, the real one. It could be a 90 degree day in the summer and it looked like it was cloudy and it was about to snow for me. Nights I spent in the bathtub where I didn't even have water running, I was just looking at the ceiling. And so being that I went through that already, I'm telling you ahead of time, 
Don't dwell on the negative. Walk towards the light. Even if the light is this big. You're in a room, you're trapped, you're kidnapped. Wood on the windows. Everything this, this. One little beam of light comes through that thing. That's where you're looking to get out. Go towards the light. Um, Let me see. See if my guest is here yet. Uh, let me tell you something. This next guest, if we get them, because, you know, we do this for the people for free. You know, you never know if they come, they might get busy, whatever. There's no politics uh, uh, engaged with um, what we got going on here. We for the people. We come on every night to inspire the people. That's the bottom line. And uh, sometimes, you know, Fat Joe, yeah, he gets crazy. But you love it when I get crazy. You know what I'm saying? But this guest is coming is... Uh, is uh, somebody I look up to, you know, somebody who paid the way for brothers like me. Um, and uh, and I love this guy and, and he supported me. I'll tell you about it when we come, um, when, we, when he comes on, how he supported me as a young guy in the game. Imagine that, I was once a young guy in the game and this guy, you know, he brought the light to me, right? Share. Uncle Dan says, I know 815, Danny, I know. I'm just uh, talking my shit, you know what I'm saying? Just getting the people ready because uh, they, they're spoiled. My, my, my followers are spoiled because every night they come on here and they don't know who's going to come on here. So you might, you know, they come on here and it's ludicrous. It's, it's uh, Alicia Keys. It's... Uh, AOC, it's uh, Cory Booker, it's, it's Dr. Fauci. They don't know what's coming. And we work really, really hard behind the scenes. Me, Dre of Cool and Dre, and Azariah, you know, it's a family business. We work really, really hard to entertain you every night to just give you look, maybe an hour to get your mind off of the shit that's going on out here. All the, all the hard times, the the the... the the depression that's out here, the, the dark, you know. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're doing here. Um, once again, shout out to my brother. I see you, E. Philly. You're going to like this one. Shout out my brother, Tone Sunshine. Uh, you know, I love you. I don't, uh, I don't, you know, I, he has a family member who's really, really sick and my heart goes out to him and his family. You know I love you. Uh, Ashante Keisha Cole, I'm going to be honest with you. I love my sister. She FaceTimed me from Africa. I don't know what the hell she's doing in Africa. And my thing is, the battle or the verses is in like two, three days. Like, what the hell are you doing in safaris in Africa, Ashanti? Get your ass over here. And so she called, bro, and, and giraffes and shit in the background and animals. And my thing is, let me ask you, yo, Nicole, so because it's Christmas, you got like a, a Santa Claus pajama on right now? <laughs> yeah, come here. <laughs> no, no, hold on, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> You're the best, man. You're the best, y'all. Yo, so I got the little Santa suit on and all that, you know? Uh, Bombs and Elf? Bombs and Elf? Oh, Alarm is an Elf. Yeah. The baby Alarm, boy, he the truth, you know what I'm saying? He, 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 the, he the man right there, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and But, you know, we trying to keep it positive. We trying to keep it uh, Christmas. We trying to keep it good vibes, you know, good vibes only. Um, but, uh, yeah, Shante hitting me. From Africa, I'm saying, yo, you make it nervous, sis. There's a celebration going on. Come here, let me see him. Look, man, look. Look, man, you're an elf. You're an elf. You're an elf. <laughs> and 
let me tell you something about them boys, man. God bless them. They so beautiful. Uh, man, that's all it's about, man. The light, having fun, showing love to our family, man. Embracing our family. That's all, man. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and so all I'm saying to you is, Ashante, get your ass back. You're having too much fun out there in Africa. We need that versus Keisha Cole, I love you very, very, very much. I'm in trouble. Terrell, we've been talking about this, right? Because they're both my sisters. And they both look to me as a brother for 20 years. We can't pick a side, but it's it's sad because with Ashanti, I always pick a side. Right? And and but this is this is a terrible time for me. Have you ever been in a situation where two of your friends is going at it and you like, what could you do? I mean, it's all in fun. So I think I'll just mind my business and enjoy the verses. Usually Ashante goes against anybody in the world and I'm with her, guns blazing. She's going against Keisha, Keisha, my other sister, family. She's there 1 million percent. You seen all my birthday singing, love. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a hard one, but I think we're going to enjoy this one. Amazing. There's amazing rumor. It's out there, Swiss. It's out there, Timberland. It's a rumor. It's out there. Foxy Brown, Little Kim. It's out there. It's a rumor. It's out there on internet and everything. Man, we're going to have to get fly for that one. We're going to have to show out for that Foxy Brown Little Kim. If it's true, it might just be a rumor, just like I'm watching Tyson against uh, Evander Holyfield, too. You know, you know, the internet do whatever they want. But that would be a mean, mean versus Foxy Brown Little Kim. It's for the culture, huh, E. Philly? Yeah, E. Philly is crazy. Yeah, E. Philly, boy, I tell you, man. All right, let me see if my man is here yet. As he asked Uncle Dan for the uh let's see if my man is here. I told him give me fifteen minutes to talk my shit and then we go. And so hopefully he's ready, but like I said, it's someone I look up to. And the thing with this guy, the minute you see him, you know you know him. You grew up watching him work forever. And the minute you see him, you're like, oh, this is the guy from, and it's too much accomplishments. You know what I'm saying? You just got to see him. Uh, Brooklyn wins, that's a fact. Brooklyn always finds a way of winning. I see my man Stephen A. Smith going bad on Kyrie Irving today. I seen him going bad. You know what I'm saying? So we got to see what's going on. Kyrie got big shoes to fill. Start December 22nd. I love that basketball's coming back. But him and KD, there ain't no more excuses. They got that boy Doon Widow, whatever his name is. I'll be crazy. Brooklyn needs to produce. Who's in the building? Boom, the biggest show. Uncle Dan, where we at with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Foxy Little Kim will be up there with the snowman and Gucci. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something that really, really makes sense. You know, uh, the thing that Timberland and Swiss made uh, it's really beautiful because this thing would have never happened if it wasn't a pandemic and the world was coming to an end and everybody came together, Patty and Gladys and Brandy and Monica, stuff we would have never, never seen in our life. So what we want to see is LL Cool J and not LL Cool J. He's there? Okay, let me see. You know, what we want to see is that Foxy, that Kim makes sense, that Gucci man, that that uh, Jeezy made sense. Uh,
Uncle Dan, I don't see him. Uh, you don't see him, just call the whole thing up. Yeah, tell him, uh, yo, I'll tell him he can come in the comments. Because my people, they wait, and they wait, and they want, they want to see it. They smell blood, they taste. These are connoisseurs, even if they vegan. They want to see what's going on tonight. Can Joe pull it off again for nine months straight? And guess what? We don't want to see the same guy or girl we've seen for nine months. We want somebody new. Huh? That's what the big, big show is about. Huh? You want to see somebody new every day. Let's see what Joe could do. <laughs> Woo-wee. I want you to get his yonder from Uncle Dan. Here we go. Is that the way they spell it? No, no, that ain't it. That's what it was. Uh... It's on. Ladies, yeah, 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 yeah. We got him now. We got, because he got imposters. When you're a superstar like Louis Guzman, you got like Louis Guzman 101, Louis Guzman from the hood, Louis Guzman. The, you know, you got people trying to be you on the Instagram, but, but you know, we got to find the original. Que pasa, Wally? What's up, bro? How are you, bro? A blessing to you. Yo, Louis Guzman, uh, we love you. You've been in the game for 40 years. You've kept it true to your roots. You've always been a real one. Uh, if they don't know you, they know you. They, we've seen you in so many TV shows, so many movies, uh, an incredible actor. And me personally, I want to thank you before we go on because many years ago when I first came out, I shot my second video and I had asked you to get in the video and you did it for me. And you was already a huge star, huge success. And you said, here goes this little Puerto Rican brother trying to make it. Because at the time, I was a little Puerto Rican brother. <laughs> we didn't know that uh, Joe was going to make it big. And you came through for me. And I've, been, I've always been in debt to you for that. And I ain't going to lie to you. Every time I see you in person, it touches the back of the brain. Like, wow, this man was here for me when I need him. And I, and I first started. And I appreciate you for that. And I'm always in debt to you for that. Well, my brother, I just want to tell you, I'm proud of you. You know, I remember how we all came up back. You know, and um, this, I checked out a few, and I'm happy that you're doing this for the community, especially in these times. But we got we got a good history, and uh, we're going to keep it moving. Absolutely. Lou, let me tell you, you look great, bro. You, you look fucking great. I'm not going to lie to you. Oh, um, now nah, you're looking great. You're looking better than ever right now. I'm not lying to you. I don't know what you've been doing in COVID. How you been How you been maintaining to keep the weight down during COVID, staying safe? Um, well, right now I'm in North Carolina and I'm shooting a show. I like that. And uh, it's really, a, I, get, I get COVID tested every three days. I have to deal with like social distancing, which is huge here. I uh, really don't go out anywhere. So I go to work and I come home, you know, and I do a lot of cooking. Uh, here at home, I do, I do yoga, brother. I do stretching, you know. I dance in the kitchen. I keep myself active, you know what I mean? But you know, I, Lou, uh, to your credit. Go off to the races. You know, Lou, to your credit, you've been in the game over 40 years. At one time, People shied away from being Boricua, from being Puerto Rican, or being black. You know, if you was light-skinned enough to say you was white, they was doing that. If you was uh, Puerto Rican and you didn't want to be that, and you want to be something else, you would say you something else, right? Um, but you never shied away from that. You always said, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm from New York, and I'm proud of it. At a time when nobody was breaking down doors like that, what was that like and what made you say, I mean, obviously you look Boricua, but what made you say, Yo, I'm going to wave this flag and I'm going to be who I am because a lot of our people try to be something else. 
to get accepted. Well, I, I, I think the beautiful thing about our people, about Boricuas in general, we are a very diversified race, man, you know, because, you know, we carry, we carry a, a African DNA, a European DNA, and a Caribbean DNA, you know? And so, brother, I, I got to tell you, man, people have, have asked me, am I Cuban? Am I Colombian? Am I Mexican? You know, am I from Venezuela? You know, stuff like that. So I just try, I mean, look, first of all, I'm proud to be Boricua, Puerto Rican. I was born in Puerto Rico, raised in New York City, you know? But the thing is that I reflect a whole Latin nation pretty much, you know? Mm -hmm. We've done all those roles, you know? And, um, you know, uh, I give a lot of credit to people like, like Raul Julia, because he opened a lot of doors back in the day. You know, he was a phenomenal actor, Boricua, you know? But the man knew Shakespeare, you know, he did, a great movie, uh, Kisses the Spider Woman, uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. Uh, another one, Rita Moreno. You know, so there's like a lot of people that, you know, when I came onto the scene back in like 1985, feels like 400 years ago, you know, we were, we were always the, uh, the drug dealers and the matadores, and stuff like that, you know. So little by little, I grew out of that, you know, because. People, I guess, you know, directors and producers, they just saw my ability and stuff like that, you know. And so I, I, I champion, you know, to be diverse, diverse in the acting world and stuff like that. You know, one question that people always ask me is like, when is Hollywood going to give Latinos a break? And brother, I've, I've heard that for so long, for so long. I don't even answer that question anymore because... It's on, it's on us to give ourselves a break. I mean, we, we, you know, we have writers, we have directors, actors. You know, what we, what we need is among our own people, like, yo, put up the money, here, go do a movie. Boom. You know? Because we're, we're talented. You know, that's where know we at. That's where we at with it right now, Louis. Like, I got a movie sold to our Warner brother. It's called King Cato. And it's based on my man from Chicago, who, you know, he eventually got killed by Little Chop or whatever. It's a long story, but uh that's where we at now. That's that's where I feel you're at, we at, and we gotta we gotta take the baton and take it another level and start shooting our own series, our own movies, our own, you know, this is the time right now to get that done. Yeah, because you know, like I started a production company recently with my son, Semi, uh, called Dark Rabbit Pictures. And right now, our first project is going to be finishing a documentary that I shot. I went homeless for three days in New York City in March. And uh, I lived in the street because I just wanted to give a, a face to homeless people, you know? And, and uh, probably the hardest thing I ever did, brother, the first night I slept in the street, the second night I slept in the shelter, you know. Um, so we're, we're Did they the notice you, Louis, at all? Did they notice you? First in three days, brother. What, what, because, you know, I grew my beard. I had, I had these, like, thick frame glasses and stuff. You know, who, you know who noticed me more than people? Dogs. People, dogs. They would growl at me. They would bark at me, you know. You know, you know, Lou, uh, I often drive past homeless people and see people talking to themselves and see them there. And it tears my heart apart because for one, mental illness. For two is everybody has their own unique story and we judge them all as a population. Yeah. I mean, what are some of the, the, the realest things you learned doing this documentary uh, that surprised you? Uh, number one, how lonely it is to be, to be among thousands and thousands of people and, and feel lonely and to feel by yourself and to feel that the only person you have to talk to is you. Because when you're walking down the street and people see a homeless person, they turn their head. I felt that. Um, uh, I got delirious the second day and, uh, 
I made a sign. I sat on the steps of the New York Public Library and I made a sign in cardboard and the sign said, I see you. See me? You know? And this little old lady walked up, was walking into the library. She stopped. She looked down at me and she said, I see you. That one person made my day. You know? And, uh, and uh, I showed, I showed the do a rough cut of the documentary in a few places and so many people have walked up with like tears in the eyes saying, yo, I've been- Powerful, because we, it's something we've all thought about. Uh, it's the elephant in the room. It's something we've all looked, if we're compassionate, if we love people, if we're about human, re uh, human beings, we look at it and we just say, Konya, what happened? What made this person snap? What, what, why are they like that? Are, do, are they all drug addicts? Are they all drunks? They're not. You know, what people don't realize is, yo, know, there's like a lot of people that take care of their parents, of their elderly parents. And don't, they don't work. You know, they, they're home, taking care of the parents, living off their Social Security or their pension. And when those parents die and that person doesn't have a job, they get evicted. And those people end up homeless, you know? And there's also people that go through psychological stuff. You know, they go through, through mental breakdowns and they kick, either get kicked out of their house or they just don't go home because it's like, you know, there's nothing to go home to. You know, all homeless people are not addicts, are not alcoholics. You know, there's like a lot of psychological stuff, social. Stuff. You know, I, I, I be feeling bad, uh, Lewis, because sometimes I'm at the light Homeless guys asking for money. I'm in a Rolls Royce. You know, I used to be in the streets. I used to hustle. The last thing I'm going to do is give him some money so he could go buy some crack or some heroin. Um, and sometimes I feel bad about it because I got a pocket full of money. And I'm like, uh, and my daughter always tells me, your dad, you want to give, and, and, you know, I got like a no tolerance policy of giving somebody money to use drugs, whether it's a family member, it's a brother, it's a, it, you know, and uh, and I'm conflicted at those times. Well, you know, you know what I do in those situations. You know, if if at all possible, I ask somebody, yo, you want to eat? Can I get you something to eat? You know, mm -hmm. if I have if I had hat and hat and gloves on. You know, my hat, you want my gloves? You know, because it's real easy for me to go get something. Another pair. Yo, Lou, let me ask you something. Did anybody pass you anything to eat while you did the documentary? Say that again? Did anybody give you something to eat? Did anybody walk up with a Burger King or a McDonald's and say, here, bro, you hungry? I, I was walking I was walking down the street. I saw a guy with a pizza box. And I go, yo, can I have that? The guy didn't even look at me. He gave me the pizza box. There were two and a half slices there. It was cold, but that was the best pizza I ever had in my life, bro. Yeah, and, 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 and that's that that's a beautiful thing. You grew up Lower East Side, right? Lower East Side, yeah. Well, I grew up I was born in Puerto Rico. Then, you know, my family, we lived in uh, uh, Cortona Park in the South Bronx for a minute. That's where I'm from. And then from there, we went to uh, Chelsea. We lived in Chelsea for a bit. And then we went, we lived in the West Village from like 1960 to 1969. And then 1969, my family moved to Lower East Side, and we've been there since. Um, a lot of drugs out there. Uh, a lot of everything. Lower East Side, people don't understand. That was actually the hub of the whole entire drug trade in New York City. P they would feed the rest of the city with yep. drugs, and um, because it was close to you know whatever. And um, what was it like to 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 chase your dream of being an actor and not getting caught in that life. Because growing up in the Lower East Side, you walk right out the door and your boys are making money. You walk outside the door, your boys are getting high. Um, what was that like to dodge that life? Well, you know, look, I wasn't perfect, you know, because I used to dip and dab. I never dealt, though. You know, but my thing was that uh, I just that nobody ever retired from being a drug dealer. Mm. Nobody retires with a pension from being a drug dealer. And, uh, you know, you used to see, man, you know, guys that grew up together start taking each other out because people get greedy for money and stuff like that. It's like, you know, I just didn't want that kind of life. And plus, I had a conscience, you know. 
I used to hang out a lot at the New York Rican Poets Cafe, back at the original one, back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know, I have people like Chino Garcia, who was a community activist, God who bless. to this day is one of my mentors. You know, so I, I hung out with community actors. I hung out with poets. I hung out with with, with, with musicians. Yeah, smoke my weed. You know, I drink my wild iris back in those days, stuff like that. But I just never gravitated to, you know, dealing drugs because my consciousness was, yo, we're killing our own people. You know, this is this is like like we're creating creating genocide, we're putting genocide on ourselves, you know? So I didn't shift to that, you know, because again, my conscience was pretty clear and stuff. Like acting, I tell you, bro, acting, it was an accident. I was a social worker at Henry uh, One day, a couple of kids didn't show up to my program. I went out into the street looking for them. I ran into Miguel, who I hadn't seen in four years, and he told me, 24 team show, once you see get a part, I didn't think nothing of it. I went in. Three weeks later, I'm co-starring here in Miami. And Joe, this is the guy down the street. All I wanted was enough money to car, but drive to Orchard Beach on the weekends and not have to take the train and the bus. I swear, if that's what I would have done, that's all I would have done. So let me ask you something. Louis, Louis, so you are... Uh... So, so you was one of the what you was in section five on your beach on a Sunday. You was in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, baby. Yo, they was throwing down. You got the Acapulias. You got the Mirawas. You got the oh, South Side. You got the. Oh yeah, and then we um, go and wait for the sun to go down because we have to sober up for the drive back. <laughs> you know. Louis, I, um, uh, also, the elephant in the room is we can talk about everything. You've done everything from uh, Narcos to Boogie's Nights to Taking the Pelham to the Bone Collector, Puerto Ricans in Paris, Dumb and Dumber, Crocodile Dundee, Journey to the Mystery. I mean, over 40 years, but obviously, believe it or not, your breakout role is in Carlitos' way. Oh, yeah. Bachanga. Sometimes oh, yeah. it bees like that. That's right. Um, what was it like the last time Al Pacino played a Latino with Scarface? You know, you it, you know what was it like when, when when you got that role for Carlitos where you was like, on your yo, this is gonna be fucking, you know, this is epic right here. This is the city, this is the the time. You know, what was that like when you got that role and how did you get that role? Well, bro, it's funny how it happened. So uh, the night before I would audition, my uh, my brother team and and uh, my cousin Eric came over to my apartment, and they were hanging out Times Square Park, you know, over, and they found this leather jacket, bro, this leather jacket, all these zippers, and it was like, oh shit, that's a character, and it's like that's something Pachanga would wear. So oh, they gave it to me, and I wore that jacket to the audition. So I went in, and I started reading my lines. And Brian the Palmer said, he starts cracking up. And I'm like, oh, shit, fuck, you know? So I did it. I got in. I got out. By the time I got home, the machine, the light was going on and off, and it was Bonnie Timmerman who was casting. The and I knew before my agent. And she said, yo, Papa, you got to go out of Pachanga. And that's how it happened. And, you know, I didn't know how it was going to turn out or nothing like that. But, you know, Edwin Torres wrote it, the New York State Supreme Court judge, pretty badass, a very eloquent writer, Boricua. You know, I did two movies that, that of two of his books, Cardiquay and Q&A. And, &A. and, um, and so when I got that role, bro, for for one, I'm like, I didn't think about Al Pacino, you know, from Scott. I thought about Al Pacino from Dog Day Afternoon at Serpico. Mm -hmm. So for Dog was badass. That was a badass movie. movie, bro. You know, so. Uh, well, Ser uh, Serpio, Ser Ser uh, Serpio, when he's the cop that, get, 
that gives in the other cop and they set him up. That was a mean oh yeah, but movie. But let me let me tell you, man. Um, I was nervous because I, here I am working with my idol, you know. And I had to call one of my boys, you know, because table reading. I said, yo, you know, and my boy, my boy said it the best. He said the best thing. Said, Papa, you grew up in this shit. You mm. know, like, like you know what it tastes like. You know, and you have to steer it, take it, and go. And that was the best advice anybody ever gave me. And so, you know, I did. You know, and we had a great cast. You know, John uh, Leguizamo. You know, it's a. Uh, uh, I mean, Benny Blanco. Benny Blanco played one of the co you. Benny Blanco played one of the coldest roles in the universe. That was Benny Blanco from the Bronx, bro. Yo, and I know Benny Blanco was still looking over his back every fucking day. <laughs> yo, yo, so listen, so Louis, uh, I learned from movies. It, it, you know, in in uh, one of my favorite movies is uh, with Chaz Palmieri, uh, Bronx Tale. Oh, yeah. And when he tells Cologino, Cologino keeps chasing this guy who owes him $12 or whatever. He, he said, look, look at it this way. You got rid of that guy for $12, right? So I learned, you know, when I, when I got shot one time, I was bullying a guy that owed me like two, $10, and I had a bunch of money. You know, I was hustling, and I kept bullying him, and one day he turned on me because he was scared of me and shot me twice. And so from Carlito's way, I learned that if a young kid is the next one up, you show him a little love when he says, yo, go to your fat Joe, what's up, my brother? Yo, what's going on? Yo, yeah, yo, 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 what's up? You know, yeah. I felt like Benny Blanco, all he wanted was that acknowledgement from Carlito. But Carlito was so arrogant because he was the big dog. He was like, yo, man, I ain't saying shit to this guy. But every now and then, you got to embrace the ones coming up. And I think that was Carlito's mistake. Yeah, because, you know, you know the mistake, too, is like, Carlito was old school, and Benny Blanco was the new school coming up. So it's like you say, you know, there was no love and stuff. You know, that, that, that young guy, he couldn't take the risk, you know? It means putting a plug in you, that's what he's going to do, because now he's making a name for himself. So it's a shame that it has to be that way. He's that way. And you told him. You said, Carlito, we got to kill this guy. It's a dangerous guy. Let's kill him. Yo, he yo. said, nah, 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 nah. And that was that was his demise. We would have been up to Carlito's weight 12 right now. He would have listened to me. You would have just kept going with it. You would have you would have been in there somewhere, yo. <laughs> you know, I was mad. My, I was mad, Louis. Because you know our brother Mark Anthony, our sister J Lo, I honestly believe I gave him the the idea to do the cantante. Me, cause when it was the style of wear these shirts with a person's face on it. I mean, for a whole fucking year, while Lean Back was number one, I would wear Hector Labo's face on my shirt all the time. MTV Awards, wherever. And I remember I get in a conversation with them. And Mark Anthony was like, you see, I'll tell you that Hector Lavo's the man. He's telling J-Lo all that, right? One day we hanging out. Next thing you know, they make the movie. I said, damn, man, I could have been a fucking doorman. Something in that motherfucker. Like, I wanted a bartender. I could have gave some, lit somebody a cigar just to be a part of that. Um, and, no, you uh, and, and so you, you know, you played so many, so many roles. I want to say... Uh, so when I first, because I was young, and you know, we got Tony Montana tattooed on our arm. The whole terror squad got it, right? So when Carlito's Way first came out, I liked it, but didn't love it. Because I was thinking it's going to be Scarface shooting a million people. And then as years went on, I saw the beauty of the movie and was like, oh my God, this is one of the most amazing movies of all time. You know, once you get off the shoot 'em up bang back bang back aspect of it, and you and you really get into the movie, it's one of the most beautiful movies ever done. I yeah. want to go into uh, 
traffic because I've always had the greatest crush on Catherine Zeta Jones. I've always like, what was that like traffic, doing traffic with Don Cheadle? I mean, you worked with some of the biggest heavyweights, but that movie right there, Frankie Flowers, all that, uh, what was that like? Well, number one, Catherine is a wonderful human being. She was really sweet, you know. Uh, I was thrilled to work with her. She's a very beautiful woman. Um, is she banging in person, Louis? That's all I want to, you know, you see a girl on Instagram, she might look good, you see her in person. Is Catherine Zeta banging in person? Is she looking yeah. like, holy she's shit? She's naturally beautiful, absolutely, absolutely. You know, but, um, you know, but but the thing is, you know, working with Don Cheeto, bro, let me tell you something, bro. Don and I, we never talked about our scenes. We would go in, we would tell our director, Steve Soderbergh, yo, let's, sh let's just shoot it. We wouldn't even rehearse the shit. And then we end up improvising half the scenes and stuff like that. So we had we had a great, great chemistry, you know? Um, I love I love that movie. I love the whole story, you know, working with Tambien Benicio was in it, you know, so we had good represent, we got really good representation in that story. Man, that was an amazing story, and I can see how y'all did that. It's similar to, like, nowadays. At first, I didn't, but nowadays, when I record music, I don't even want to listen to the music. I don't want to, I want to go in the studio and then play the music and let me come up with the song on the spot, like, improvise and get fresh ideas and you know it might be shit me and you talking about and i'll go up to the studio we play the music and i'm just all in there i don't want it like it the art to be premeditated so you guys are like yo i know you you know me you know what we are supposed to do here let's go off the top yeah and that's what we did that's what we did with all of our things salute the, salute the og man salute the og hold on hold on hold on I got to say, yo, salute the OG. Bless up. <laughs> nah, that, that, that's He's a, a, yo, that's a legend. Yeah, 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 Lou, I think he trying to look yeah, like yeah. you, bro. This no, guy but, stole I, your look, man. I ain't going to lie. I told my I told my agent, like, I can we ain't do no movie together yet. Me and you, like, it, me and you together, I'm telling you, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. I'm ready, baby. Listen, <laughs> the dialogue with me and you back and forth going out, it's going to be big. That's I'm telling you. Fat boy swag and all that, you know what I'm saying? And as long as we survive at the end, we're fucking good, y'all. <laughs> we'll do to part 12. Nah, I just yeah. want to send my love, brother, man. Happy holidays. God bless you. Congrats bless on everything. You. you know what I mean? Boricua. That's right, baby. Yeah. That's right. You know what I'm saying? You're Louis, man. <laughs> you know, I broke in this house and did the show from this house, you know? Yo, this is this, this what I want to tell you, Joe. Uh, I got, I got, I got to tell you some things, Joe. So first of all, I'm really proud of you, man. Um, uh, um, some time ago, you posted something about your son, you know, and your son and and uh, about his autism and stuff, you know. And I want to tell you, bro, that really touched me, man. I was really proud of you for that. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, we could be entertainers and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, we are a real person. We are men. We are fathers, you know. And and you really touched me, you know, when you spoke about your son. And I'm happy that you did that. Only well, you know, too. we're like regular people. You know what happened, um, Lou, is that, you know, my son, I always try to protect him because I chose this life of being a public figure. You know, I got to have thick skin if people talk about me or disrespect me in any way. You know, my son is autistic and, and and we love him and we raise him my whole life. And that's one thing I can't do is handle people disrespecting my family or anything like that. So that's why I've always been private with my son. But um, I know there's a bunch of parents out there that are, are suffering from the same things and going through the hard things. It's not easy having an autistic son or daughter. You know, and a lot of people run away from it. You know what I'm saying? And you know, what's crazy, um, Lou, and I know people get mad at me. Well, well, the other side get mad at me, but you know, when he was born, 
his mother said to give him to adoption that she couldn't raise him. And my mother and father was like, fuck that, he's ours. And so we raised little Joey. And, and let me tell you something, this kid's the happiest kid in the world. All he knows is love. All he knows is we, we show him nothing but love. This guy smiles 24 hours a day. Like, all he does is smile and have fun. But, you know, it's a real heartbreaking story with my son because, you know, he's never had no, you know, the door's always been open for uh, his mother or his, uh, his, he got brothers and sisters to, to, to see their brother or whatever the case may be. And they really chose not to support him. So the only thing that bothers me when I look at Joey is, because he got everything he needs, but the only thing that bothers me with him is like, damn, man, his mom's never ever saw him again. You know, his his brothers and sisters, you know, it's supposed to be one of them to cross the line and be like, yo, that's my brother. Can yeah. I see him? You know what I'm saying? So it's so so in a way, he's not lonely because we give him all the love and all the warmth. But that's what bothers me when it when it when it comes to him is, you know, and just and just the feedback is. So many parents hit me up, so many uh, parents. And, you know, I think I got to do more for, like, autistic kids. You know what I mean? I think I got to I gotta do more because what happens is once they become uh, adults, so, so-called adults, but you still got to take care of them, um, once the school is over and you try to take them to any type of program so they can talk to other kids, they're dirty, they're like, you know, and so pretty much they all wind up staying home where they don't have a place to uh, socialize with other autistic, you know, young adults. You know what I mean? So that's something in the back of my mind. Shout out to Sexy Steph. Her son is autistic and she's been drilling that in my head as well. And a lot of parents hit me up in the DM and her name is Joe. You know, my kid is autistic. It's Stephanie Mills. Her son just wrote a book. He's autistic. Yeah, there you go. And uh, and he's so beautiful, you know. And and so I guess when you got that, you know, you know, when I see another autistic kid, you know, my heart just, you know, loves. You know that that's one thing where you could catch Fat Joe off guard and love because I know what I deal with my son. And when I see another autistic kid, and somebody says, "Take a picture," immediately the smile comes to my face. I embrace the kid. I I think weird too. Like maybe the kid knows I got a kid that's autistic. You, you so, got what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, and I, I also, you, I don't know, you know this show that I, for my, I have five kids and I adopted four of them, you know? So, you know. That is amazing. So as, as fathers, you know, you with an autistic son and me with four beautiful uh, adopted kids and, and my daughter Luna, you know, like I said, man, it's, we're good people, bro. We're good people, you know, we... <laughs> We had to learn things, man. We had to learn a lot, but you know, we took on the task, you know, and we done the, the best that we can, you know? You know, I don't know if you know, I started this show with a Gran Combo, right? To Mexique Brujeria. Through Every her. black family heard that motherfucker at six in the morning next door from the Puerto Rican family. Uh, who are some of your favorite Sacedos and why? Well, first of all, Definitely way up there, a Gran Combo, you know, uh, Chel Feliciano, let me tell you, Mark Anthony, I, I don't think a day goes by that I don't listen to one of his songs, you know, and plus that's our brother, you know. You know, he, 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 he called me on here on my birthday, I celebrated my birthday, he came on and, and, and I was groupied out, I couldn't believe Mark Anthony was on the Fat Joe show, and that's our brother. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's that. He's that serious, bro. Right, um, Louis. Bro, years ago, years ago, he showed up with the band to a club. Where my buddy was celebrating my birthday party. He showed up with the band, and they played for two hours in New York years ago. That's that's that, that's a brother there, you know, uh, Hector Lavon. You know, I love Hector Lavon. You know, um, my favorite Puerto Rican singer of all time, I gotta say, is Danny Rivera, because that man's voice is an instrument, and he's beautiful. You know, so yeah, bro. But you know, man, 
You just put out some salsa music and I'm on the dance floor. That's it, brother. What does That's right. Let me ask you a question. Um, so Casa Delas, you know, with Low East Side, we gotta talk. You know, Jimmy's cafe's out, Jimmy's our brother. Right? Jimmy is that's it, his home team. Brother, one million percent. And then from the low east side is Casa Delas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I knew the lady, man, she rests in peace. Every time I'm in New York, I go there. Uh, what what are your favorite uh, Latino restaurants in New York? Well, definitely, definitely Casa Adela. Definitely Jimmy. You know? See, I'm not going to lie to you. That's pretty much the only two I go to. Me you know? too. That's all I need. That's all I Me need. Me too. You know? Me too. And um, in LA, I always go to this uh to this George Cuban restaurant called Floridita. 